right, gang, welcome back to another wonderful lecture. Um, we are going to be working on week two, unit two. Um, I have just given you guys a little prequel per se. Uh, in the last video that hopefully you watched first, talking about the mechanical and electrical mechanisms associated with the cardiac cycle and contraction of the heart. Well, the reason we did that is because today we are going to start talking about some complications that occur uh, within that very same, uh, those those autorhythmic cells and within the cardio, um, the cardio muscles or the myocardium, right? This muscle here and some disruptions in the node communication and the internodal pathways. And of course, um, some disruptions in blood flow with the coronary artery and the branches of the coronary artery that basically deliver uh, blood to much of the contracting muscles or the cardiomyocytes in the heart. So we are going to talk about these things in depth today and uh, talk about how we would essentially um, prescribe exercise for somebody that is recovering from a myocardial infarction or uh, somebody that is living with hypertension and is on their way towards myocardial infarction. Um, so I'm going to get my textbook here really quick. And I know there were some issues at the textbook store. Um, so I'm not sure if we all have the same additions. Um, I did receive an email from the textbook store saying that there might be a problem with additions. So the addition that I have in my hands right now is the second edition. And I am looking at chapter four in the second edition. If you guys have a newer edition, um, please look for the myocardial infarction chapter. Um, it should be under, let me find the, uh, the main category here. Uh, just bear with me while I amplify my page turning here. Um, it should be under the section called cardiovascular disease. Okay, so that's section two in my textbook. And if we are having issues with textbooks, or if you have an edition where um, something is missing, uh, reach out to me ASAP, and we will take care of that. Do not fret. I already have contingency plans in place to help with that. So make sure you read all of the information on the cardio, the myocardio infarction, every single page. Um, everything I tell you on this lecture and everything in the book is fair game for quizzes and exams as well as the journal articles that I give you, everything is fair game, which is why I also give you the uh, article extraction sheet to pull out as much information as possible, and also the pathophysio map or the patho map, which is basically giving you, um, I don't know how many of you guys collected baseball cards when you were younger or football cards or uh, whatever cards you might have collected. But the idea behind the patho maps is, you are making a, a card per se that, that characterizes each of the pathologies we're going to talk about. It's going to have how we assess and how we prescribe and things that we have to consider when assessing and prescribing so that it's all in front of you. Um, also, when you guys submit your um, extraction sheets to me, um, I look at them and I see common threads amongst what you guys all submit. And that's how I kind of design my quiz questions. So um, I'm definitely keeping you guys in mind, um, trying to make this as least painful as possible if you do the work. All right. So let's get going in the lecture here. Um, so what is a myocardial infarction? Uh, essentially, it's a heart attack, okay? And it, it occurs when the coronary artery is blocked uh, suddenly or has an extremely slow and low blood, fill, um, blood flow that is being delivered to the heart, okay? So there's a substantial um, decrease or a complete disruption of the blood flow through the, through the coronary artery. Now, a myocardial infarction is, is basically, there's a couple of hits that happen, okay? That is one of the hits, okay? So we have 
a decrease in blood flow. The second hit would be that because there's a decrease in blood, in blood flow, the tissues that are demanding oxygen are going to have limited oxygen for a, a, a an extended period of time. And as a myocardial infarction or a heart attack gets worse and worse, there's going to be more substantial disruption of blood flow, blood flow. And that's generally going to be due to the development of arthrosclerosis and plaque. Um, with the decrease in blood flow, we're going to have a decrease in oxygen delivery. And by now you guys should know that the, the heart and the cardiomyocytes um, are uh, filled with mitochondria. They're, they're they have way more mitochondria than most other tissues in the body because it is a primary aerobic uh, tissue, primarily an aerobic tissue. So it likes to use fatty acids. It likes to metabolize fatty acids through um, mitochondria and oxidative phosphorylation. And it likes to make ATP through that pathway. And uh, when the uh, heart starts experiencing complications, well, then it starts to shift towards more glycolytic pathways, which is um, not ideal for this type of muscle, okay? Um, this is also considered, uh, this heart attack that we were talking about is also considered a myocardial infarction. So a lot of people don't know this term for it, and I'm just gonna keep repeating it because I remember when I was learning this, I'm like, what the hell is an infarction? And uh, yeah, so and this, um, a myocardial infarction is basically, it can also impact the myocardium, okay? Um, and it can permanently destroy this muscle. So what I have here for you guys is I'm just kind of showing you uh, what a heart uh, muscle looks like, right? Or you can see the individual um, uh, cardiomyocytes, right? And we know that cardiomyocytes, uh, especially those of you that are in 450A, um, 456A, we kind of, we're kind of talking about this. Um, we know that cardiomyocytes are similar to skeletal muscle, right? We know that uh, they have contractile properties such as uh, myosin and actin. We know that calcium is released when there is a depolarization of the sarcolemma. And we know that uh, that depolarization cr travels across, across the sarcolemma and um, down the T-tubules. And then uh, it activates the sarcoplasmic reticulum and calcium floods the cell. And then we have calcium binding to troponin. And then we have cross bridge formation with myosin and actin, right? So we know that that can happen, right? Um, and we know that cardiomyocytes are branched. So you can see here, they're kind of like a branched sort of uh, cell where skeletal muscle is is uh, straight and linear. We know that cardiomyocytes are, they usually have a single nuclei per, per cell. We know that they have those uh, discs and those gap junctions that we talked about on the last uh, lecture here. And the reason I'm showing you this particular picture is you can see that when we have a myocardial infarction, yeah, blood flow is disrupted. Yeah, oxygen delivery is limited, but you can see here that that leads to uh, destruction of the cells as well. So here we can see that there is damage to the myocardium, right? Which is this layer of muscle here. And that is what is, um, what is is basically essential for contraction of both the atrium and the ventricles, right? So if we have destruction towards these cells, right, we, we destroy these cells because of the onset of this condition, um, well, we're going to have long-term complications associated with, like we talked about in the previous lecture, stroke volume, ejection fraction. Um, we're going to have problems with uh, changes in pressure. The heart's going to have to work harder because the myocytes that are healthy are going to have to double the work. They're going to have to do more contracting to make up for the myocytes that are injured. So here is uh, another kind of depiction of the myocardium. And you can see that this would be kind of the outside layer of the heart. I'm just trying to identify, just kind of show you where this large muscle uh, exists. Um, this would be the outside of the heart here, which we, you know, call the pericardium. Um, and then we have this inner, this muscle layer here, which is the myocardium, right? Um, and this is the section of the heart that becomes damaged due to disruption in blood flow. 
limitation in oxygen, and uh, apoptosis or necrosis of the cardiomyocytes. So they, they begin to perish. And then this whole system, right, the whole circuit of the cardiovascular system, the entire circuit becomes compromised as we start to lose some of the, these important cells. And then just to kind of show you uh, let's go back to that previous slide. We can see those same things here, right? We can see the endocardium here, um, the subendocardium, and then the myocardium, this middle layer here. And this is where we can start to see some of that damage. We can start to see some of this uh, apoptosis um, or necrosis. The difference between the two is apoptosis is going to be the cell is purposely programming its own death. Uh, it recognizes that something is wrong, so it's going to start inducing a series of uh, biochemical processes where it's going to basically kill itself, it's going to off itself, where necrosis is the cell is essentially going to fight to stay alive, but these other factors that we're talking about is just going to kind of destroy it. It's going to wither away. Um, preferentially, if you're going to have a uh, loss of cells or tissue, you want it to be controlled and regulated through the process of apoptosis rather than necrosis, where it just begins to wither away. And the regulators that oversee that process uh, don't recognize that the damage is happening. So Let's quickly move back to this one here. Again, you can see uh, this area of the muscle is what we are concerned with. Um, if we look at the next slide here, I'm going to kind of talk a bit on this next slide. Here's where we can see the other kind of um, culprits associated with the development of a heart attack or myocardial infarction. So um, I told you that there's a couple of hits here, right? One hit here is this coronary occlusion and here is where we start to develop plaque or we start to develop blood clots okay and the blood clots and the plaque kind of work hand in hand so so the general cause of sudden blockage that we kind of see here in this coronary artery is the formation of blood clots or things that we call thrombos okay t-h-r-o-m-b-u-s okay uh, a, blood, a blood clot typically forms inside the coronary artery that has already been narrowed by atherosclerosis, right? So if we begin to, if we begin to have narrowing of this, let me see if I can have some fun here because you guys that had me last year, you guys know, can I, can I exit this? Hang on one second. Oh, geez. Um, in slideshow, here we go. Here we go. This is what I wanted. Let's have a little bit of fun. I, I like to draw. So we're going to draw. So if we have, let's just kind of say, whoop, I'm going to zoom in on this area here, right? Let's say we have a vessel. I'm drawing with my right hand and I'm left-handed, so just bear with me, okay? And we're looking at the lumen of the vessel, right? We're looking at the inside of the vessel. Well, what starts to happen is when we start to develop atherosclerosis, we start to get, uh, let me see if I can get a different pen here. Uh, let's change the color because plaque is generally yellow. So we start to develop this plaque, right? And I'm going to draw this plaque the best that I can. All right. And now what happens is that black, that, that plaque starts to protrude into the vessel, right? So we're looking at the inside of the vessel, right? This is where this is where the blood throat flows, right? Right through here. This is where the blood would be flowing. This is the actual uh, vessel itself, right? Let's make it a little longer so it looks like a blood vessel. Um, and then when we start to develop atherosclerosis, we get we get this plaque that begins to develop. And I, I will talk about what this plaque is and how it develops. Um, and what happens is when the plaque develops, you can see that. Can I make this thinner? Can I make this? Yep, I can make it. Let's try this guy you have less space inside the vessel this is an arrow and this is an arrow okay and it's just so it's showing you that the space here right the space has been limited because of this plaque formation and this plaque protrusion right and that's what begins to happen here right we begin to develop plaque it begins to protrude into the lumen of the blood vessel we begin to have less space for the blood to flow through, and we begin to start developing blood clots here, right? And that is that is kind of one of the first hits that begins to happen in this process, and we call that thrombos or thrombosis, right? Thrombos, thrombosis is the blood clotting 
that occurs here due to the plaque and due to the narrowing of the lumen of the blood vessel. So the inside of the blood vessel is getting more narrow, right? So imagine that you guys are outside, you turn on your hose, and you have this really strong stream of water coming out, and then imagine that you pinch the hose. And well, what happens is when you pinch the hose, the, the water that's coming from the spigot to where the pinch is is starting to increase in pressure, and then from the pinch to where the uh, mouth of the hose is, you begin to have water dribbling out, right? You lose that pressure. You lose that, that strong force of the water. And that's what's happening here, right? So this is just like kind of pinching that, pinching that uh, hose per se. So um, this, this thrombosis, right? This clotting of the blood and the plaque that forms within the coronary artery here, this essentially um, is the onset or it's the beginning of the atherosclerosis process, right? And atherosclerosis is a condition in which basically fatty acids or fat begins to deposit, which is this here, right? So your low density lipids, your tr cholesterol, your uh, triglycerides, this is what some of this plaque is composed of, right? And then you have inflammatory factors, um, you have macrophages, you have all these other white blood cells kind of working on this as well. And, and the result of it is you get this kind of gross hard plaque that can be disrupted, right? So if this thing were to break, uh, that's what's going to cause a heart attack. Uh, or it could even it could even get bigger, right? So this plaque could come out here and just kind of narrow that lumen of the coronary artery even more, right? So, um, so we know that this plaque is made up of fatty acids and there's, uh, you know, triglycerides and low density lipids and very low density lipids, right? Which you guys know are part of the cholesterol family. Um, now the degree of damage to the myocardium varies from individual to individual, right? There's, there's no one size that fits all. And this is where it gets tricky when you are starting to think about exercise. If somebody has a severe heart attack versus a mild heart attack, uh, well, that's that's going to be uh, it's going to look very different on their capacity to exercise, right? Because somebody that has severe heart attack, look at this here. This is the myocardium, and look at all of this damage to these myocytes, right? So this is this is a severe injury to the myocardium and a, a pretty serious heart attack. And I'm just kind of going on the outskirts of these damaged cells. So these are the healthy cells. These are the damaged cells. And then you can have a more um, mild version of that. And you can see here in the myocardium, we have some destruction, but nothing compared to this, right? So if, if we were to look at this destruction here, that would occur down here, right? So this is where the myocardium infarction is occurring in this myocardium, right? And what's so dangerous about this is let's let's just kind of draw a line here. Uh, let's use this, whatever this color is, because it's just cute. Let's draw a line here. Just divide the heart in half, okay? You guys know that the atrium is up here, our R up here, and then the ventricles are down here. So which process of heart contraction or cardiac cycle is going to be impacted most if we have damage to the heart down in this area here. If you remember from the previous slides, I told you that the bundle of Hiss and the Purkinje fibers, uh, you know, they, they, they descend downward. Here, let's use this one because I just want to keep drawing. Um, they descend downwards, right? They descend down the heart and then they go back up the heart, right? So down and back up and around. And we talked about how those those um, autonomic cells and the, uh, the, the pathway in which they, they send that impulse, it's meant to contract the ventricles to shoot blood up and out, right? So if we have damage down here, how is that going to impact blood being shot up and out? Because essentially what's happening is, uh, let's find pink. Um, the ventricles, right, they're getting a lot of damage from a myocardial infarction, at least in this picture, right? So the ventricles, the left and the right ventricles, look at where this damage is occurring, right? This damage is all within the left and right ventricles. So that's going to have a major impact 
on contraction and pressure that builds up and how much blood can be uh, released, okay? Um, some people speculate that, so, so some people, they call this myocardial infarction, they call it the silent killer, right? Because, um, let me erase this and make it look somewhat presentable again. Um, because you could have something like this and really not think twice about it. So people that have like a mild heart attack or might be developing uh, plaque and having issues, they, they could experience symptoms that uh, are very similar to the flu or they'll think it's indigestion or they'll think it's acid reflux. Um, so they, they might just kind of ignore it and be like, oh, it'll go away. And in most cases it will because this, this takes some time to develop. Um, where other, uh, something like this, right, this would be like, oh, maybe I just have indigestion. I'm, I'm not going to worry too much about it. And then um, other people, they might have something like this where it's actually, it's catastrophic, right, causing death and long-term disabilities. Um, and, you know, this is going to take years and years of rehabilitation to get the person healthy again. So the question that we're going to ask now is, is can exercise uh, stop this? Yeah. Can exercise um, reduce your chances of developing this? Yeah. Can diet reduce your chances of developing this? Absolutely 100%. Um, will sedentary behavior accelerate it? Yeah. Will sedentary behavior with a horrible diet accelerate it? Absolutely. Will sedentary behavior with a horrible diet and a history of um, heart attack uh, um, make this matter worse for people 100%, right? So um, one of the major causes of a myocardial infar infarction is lifestyle, right? And the uh, not taking care of yourself, right? So uh, let's move on to the next picture, um, the next slide. So we're going to talk about the overview now of the pathology. And I can kind of, I'm not going to draw anymore, so I'll make this a little bigger, okay? Um, and we're going to familiarize ourselves here, right? So we, we talked about um, uh, the atriums, right? The ventricles. We talked about the SA node, AV node, all that good stuff. And we're going to look here now at the coronary artery, right? We see one here, the left coronary artery and the right coronary artery. And we can see that this is going to descend down, right, the left portion of the heart and down the right portion of the heart. And if we want to get rid of the heart, we can see how that works here, right? So we see how just like the SA, the AV node, the bundles of Hiss, the Purkinje fibers, we see how that creates like this network, right, of this like this kind of netting that kind of encompasses and surrounds the heart. Well. The, the the arteries do the same thing, right? If we looked uh, back at the picture I showed you of just the autorhythmic cells and those electrical impulse pictures, you would see that they, they have a very similar design, right? They, they descend down and they go around, where when we were talking about the autorhythmic cells, they went down, right? And then they came back around, right? So that very similar design. And What's important about this is look at how these arteries branch out and then branch again, branch out, right? They go into the center of the heart. They go into the center of the heart. Well, if we start to develop plaque here and we start to develop plaque here, well, that means that everything downstream of where that plaque is developing is going to get low levels of oxygen and it's going to get low uh, low levels of nutrients delivered to it. It's it's basically going to be compromised, and everything downstream of where that plaque is developing is also going to be susceptible to degradation, right, uh, through necrosis or apoptosis. Um, so, as I said in the previous slide, the pathology begins with the accumulation of lipids and fibrous tissues within the coronary artery. Uh, it usually happens here, and I drew that wonderful picture on the other slide. I, I have another one here, but you guys all probably can agree that mine was much prettier and much better. But here you can see the plaque protruding into the lumen, right? And then we'll have blood coming here, and the blood uh, will be, red blood cells usually gener generally travel in the center of the lumen, right? So red blood cells, white blood cells, they travel in the center of the lumen, and usually the plasm, uh, the plasma, sorry, travels on the outskirts of the lumen. So once we have red blood cells and white blood cells traveling here, 
and we have a protrusion here, well, those are going to back up and we're going to start to develop thrombosis, right? Or this blood clotting. Um, this is uh, this is an accumulative process, right? Uh, it starts maybe or you could start developing this in your 30s and it will accumulate into your 40s and uh, it might show mild signs. You might get your, you know, you might think that it's not uh, not something to worry about, uh, but it will progressively narrow this lumen, right? It will progressively narrow the space in which the blood uh, and the plasma uh, basically travel through. Um, and then once this plaque is formed, Another thing that happens is we start to uh, we start to develop lesions, right, or these small sores and holes within this lining of the um, endothelial cells, right. And what happens when we start to develop these lesions or these sores is things that are in the bloodstream are now allowed to leave the bloodstream and start getting into uh, the tissue here, right, and we start having these endothelial cells uh, start to degrade and what they're meant to do is keep things within the vessel, right? Your blood, your plasma, your, your formed factors, white blood cells, red blood cells, nutrients. The endothelial cells, which is this line here, right? They're meant to contain and keep things inside of the lumen. But once they start to develop lesions, that means anything here can start getting down into different parts of the blood vessel where they shouldn't be. And all these things will start to lead to the development of myocardial ischemia, right? And ischemia just means that there's a, there's a lack of oxygen being delivered, and this generally leads to ventricle dysfunction, right? So as I said, if it starts up here, it's going to travel down, and we're going to have ventricle dysfunction. So I hope that makes sense. Um, now, let's talk a little bit about the overview of the pathology. And I'm going to spend a little bit of time here and I'm going to expect you guys to know this. So please study this section well and take good notes. So I just want to reiterate that this is a really, really important section here. And I expect you to take lots of notes and I expect you to be able to uh, answer some questions about this on your uh, quiz or exam. Um, so we need to understand the physiology or the pathophysiology so that we can correct the physiology through exercise, through diet, and through um, being an expert in, in this arena so that people that are confused and are scared and are injured and maybe living with a disability can trust that you know what you're doing as, as a professional, right? Whether you're, whether you're going to be working in a weight room whether you're going to be working in a hospital, whether you're going to be working as a physical therapist or a um, rehabilitation specialist, you need to know the science. You need to know what is happening, which is causing these disruptions. So um, lipids or lipoproteins, right? Um, these are particles, right? So this would be a version of a lipid, low density lipid, right? You all know what that is. Um, these are these are particles that crucially contribute to the development of atherosclerosis. And they are the underlining mechanism of the pathology of cardiovascular disease, right? So we can think, um, well, at least what research is telling us, there's a lot of people out there that, that a lot of researchers out there that say, hey, we might need to look at fats again and lipids again and low density lipids, uh, lipoproteins, sorry, low density lipoproteins. And we might need to reconsider this, but the majority of the research uh, that has been conducted in the last 30 years points their finger at this low density lipoprotein and triglycerides and cholesterol. Okay. So, um, this process, once we start to develop atherosclerosis, and I'm going to direct your attention over here, here's that plaque that's developing. Here's those endothelial cells that I was kind of telling you about that are meant to protect, uh, this tissue here, right? from allowing contents in the blood vessel to get into the tissue, right? That's what these guys are here. Um, this process also causes tremendous amounts of inflammation, 
okay? And this inflammation that starts to develop here starts to recruit things like leukocytes, um, and they, they basically start to invade the vascular and the cardiac cells, thereby impacting both the vessel and the heart, okay? We, we, we don't want chronic inflammation uh, in these areas because what they're going to do is keep trying to repair. And when they repair, they have to first break things down. So if we have plaque developing, and then we have these leukocytes and these white blood cells kind of coming to say, hey, I'll rescue you, don't worry about it. Yeah, it's trying to rescue you, but it's following, it, it, it's fumbling, it's, it's making mistakes by constantly being there because what's the difference between repair and constant destruction? Well, if a leukocyte or other immune cells are going to come to the tissue's rec uh, uh, rescue, part of the process is breaking down debris, right? And if we have inflammation and if we have chronic inflammation, and these white blood cells are just constantly breaking this down because you know they're they're changing they're under alterations because this plaque is building well now the very system that's there to protect us is making the matter worse by constantly breaking this down because now this endothelial cell lining loses its integrity okay so that is that is one of the things that becomes problematic um it has been heavily speculated that, and proven that there is a very high correlation of high cholesterol and increased risk of cardiovascular events that center around this guy right here, this low density lipoprotein, which is LDL cholesterol, all right? So we have a couple of players here right now. We have LDL, we have inflammation, and we have a constantly changing architecture, right? Here you can see healthy, right? Healthy endothelial cells, healthy endothelial, endothelial cells. The lumen of the vessel is uh, open and clear. Where here we have healthy, 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 and then we start to get some disruption here. Here we have healthy, 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 disruption, inflammation. We get plaque depositing and um, we get narrowing of that vessel, which is going to start causing blood clots. All right. Um, let's see this, uh, uh, and then in contrast, high density lipids here, right? Uh, these are the healthy cholesterol, uh, particles where these are the unhealthy cholesterol particles. When we have, uh, this condition developing, there's an inverse relationship with the development of atherosclerosis and HDL, which means that this gets lower and lower and lower, and this gets higher and higher and higher. And we don't want that. We want that to be inversed. Okay. So you can see here that, um, HDL, right? HDL. This is an anti-inflammatory and anti-atherogenic particle. Right, so this is the one uh, cholesterol particle that we want elevated. We want it up, and that's what it looks like in a healthy vessel. Right, so when we have a balance of HDL and LDL, well, then we have a balance of inflammation and atherogenic or atherosclerosis factors. Right, so this HDL keeps this LDL in check. Now. When we move into obesity and we move into weight gain and sedentary lifestyle and type 2 diabetes and chronic heart disease and hypertension, what starts to happen is the scale starts to tip a little bit. So we start to see that when we have more LDL and specifically oxidated LDL, um, we tip the scales and now we're pro-inflammatory and pro atherosclerosis development okay so when we lose that hdl or those hdl levels get so low we lose that protective factor right so hdl is protective ldl is destructive and as we move into sedentary behavior sedentary lifestyle that scale tips all right and we we start to develop ath uh, atherosclerosis and you guys can see here that our risk of cardiovascular uh, complications starts to go up all right we start to move up so let's look at what some of the differences are between vldl um ldl and hdl we're not going to worry about chylomicrons uh, these are just the guys that kind of transport uh, fat and lipids across your uh, duodenum and ileum and into the bloodstream. We're not really going to, and then it carries, it carries things to the liver. We're not going to really talk about that. I just want to focus on the good guy and then the two bad guys, right? The VDL, this is very low density lipids. 
This is low density lipids. This is high density lipids. So the major difference between all of these is its composition. So very low density lipids, half of these particles, which looks like this, right? Half of these particles are triglycerides. So this is half fat, all right? The, uh, there's another quarter right here, which is cholesterol. And then we have a low amount of protein, right? Now, if we look at the good guy, look at the composition over there. The good guy is mostly protein, right? It's inverse to this, right? We have half of it protein, very little of it triglycerides, very little of it, little of it phospholipids, right? This is what makes up your lipid bilayer, and then very little cholesterol. So this uh, high density lipid or lipoprotein is mostly protein. This one is mostly fat. And then the low density lipid, you can see it's very little fat, but mostly cholesterol. So the LDL is so dangerous because it's mostly cholesterol, right? And cholesterol and oxidized LDLs are what causes this guy, right? Um, so just kind of know this, right? If I said to you, what is the difference between LDL, VLDL and HDL? You would say, well, it would be the composition. So if we look at LDL, LDL has a lot of cholesterol esters. It has a lot of cholesterol and it has a lot of triglycerides. And if, you know, it has some phospholipids also. So if you look at it down here and say LDL, okay, most of it is cholesterol and that's why it's so dangerous. Look at this cholesterol, look at the purple. Look at how much of this is cholesterol, right? Um, and it has very little protein. This is the APO B100, this is the protein. So you see how little protein there is there. Um, and that's why that is so dangerous. So um, let's talk about, okay, so I hope that makes sense, right? I spent a lot of time on this. The big takeaway is having high levels of HDL is anti-inflammatory and we don't want inflammation here because inflammation starts to kind of help this plaque develop faster. Uh, LDL is pro-inflammatory and pro-atherosclerosis, right? And if we have too much of the LDL and especially oxidized LDL, which is more harmful, um, it's basically a, a harmful version of LDL, that oxidation is what allows this destruction and it allows the um, immune cells and it allows the plaque to, to kind of build up and uh, to develop. So if we have LDL that is being oxidized and being damaged and being split open, well, most of this plaque, we can say, okay, well, that plaque is mostly cholesterol because if this thing is putting its contents, if, if, if it's breaking its contents into this aqueous solution, then most of that is cholesterol, most of that is triglycerides, and most of it is a pre-cholesterol ester. So that is what is making up all of this wonderful, beautiful yellow plaque right there. All right. Now, once we start to develop this plaque, we also start to develop lesions. Okay. So let me, let me move over to this next slide here. Uh, give me one second. Uh, where's my cursor? There it is. Okay. Um, if we look here, the vessels or the coronary vessel starts to develop these lesions, which is small tears or sores or gaps in the vessel itself. So you guys see that, right? You see that there? And that's what starts to cause greater complications. So now we have, uh, we have thrombosis starting. So we have blood clots. We have plaque building, and that plaque is um, partially due to low-density lipoproteins or low-density lipids that are oxidized and begin to accumulate. And then we have immune response, which is trying to save the tissue, but in an effort to save the tissue, it's also contributing to these lesions, which is allowing all that stuff to kind of spew out into the tissue and leave the vessel. Um, and you guys can see here, I have a picture here of thrombosis for you guys. Um, you can see here the blood clots starting here. And you can see how that vessel is starting to get slightly wider. Um, and then with the blood clots starting there, 
the damage is going to start occurring there and the lesions are going to start occurring there and then everything downstream is going to be problematic. Um, so the thrombosis is going to also help lead to the formation of that plaque uh, alongside with oxidized LDL. We're going to have inflammatory infiltration. We're going to have macrophage attack. So there's all these things that are going to be happening here and then we're going to start getting the plaque developing. Um, on this next slide here, um, the other contributor to this entire process is uh, are our foam cells. Okay, so let's look at it again here. We can see that we have the coronary artery and then we start to develop the plaque here. Okay, so I, I put this picture up here because I, I, I like this. We have lipoproteins. Okay, those lipoproteins become oxidized. And once they become oxidized, they start to cause, they start to recruit macrophages. They start to recruit uh, inflammatory cells. And then we get these foam cells, okay? So what are foam cells? Well, foam cells are important components of the, basically of the plaque generation, okay? So these guys are going to help make this plaque, okay? Um, they're also considered macrophages, right? So here's a macrophage. A macrophage um, is, we're just going to say it's a, an immune protein that is going to kind of try to scavenge and pick up things and consume them, debris that shouldn't be there. And foam cells are a type of macrophage. Um, and they're going to play a, 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 a critical role in plaque development. So if I were to ask you, um, what was the major component of plaque development? Uh, you might say, okay, well, macrophages and foam cells, these are both major players in it. Um, these guys are triggered mostly by the presence of low density lipoproteins, okay, or the LDL. So if we have a lot of these things in the cell, or I'm sorry, in the lumen, and they start to make their way into the tissue, well, their presence, especially when they're oxidized, they're going to recruit macrophages and foam cells. Okay, so um, know these pieces. We have lipoproteins, we have oxidized lipids, which is oxidized lipoproteins, which is oxidized LDLs. These uh, versions of LDL are gonna recruit macrophages and foam cells. And you're probably saying to yourself right now, well, what, what the hell is an oxidized lipid? Well, the reason I'm not telling you is I want you to look it up and I want you to try to wrap your head around it. Uh, I'm going to give you a lot, but I'm also going to make you make you work a bit. So you guys look that up and see if you can decipher that and see what it what it means and what it does. OK, so once the LDLs are oxidized, they recruit macrophages and foam cells. Very, very important in the generation of plaque. Um, so uh, they're also kind of highly upregulated when there is an imbalance of cholesterol um, in, in the blood vessels, right? So if we have a high level of LDL and a low level of HDL, well, then that's going to activate these guys. Um, and the foam cells are just basically another important mechanism involved in the development of this myocardial infarction. Um, and they're going to essentially exacerbate the condition more. Now, uh, we could, we could literally spend an entire day day talking about foam cells and their the mechanisms of action but i'm just trying to introduce you to the major players when you guys take my pathology class um as a master's if you guys stay here and do your master's here we will go into uh, a lot of foam cell stuff um but we're just not going to do it right now because there's just not enough time so pathology uh let's look at a little more here so here i got another picture all these things should be making sense to you you should be like oh, okay i get it Red blood cells, white blood cells, they like to travel through the center of the lumen, plasma on the outskirts of the lumen. And when we have high levels of LDL, because we're inactive and we're not exercising and we're eating a lot of food that contains cholesterol. So those of you that are enjoying your, uh, your eggs, right? Your, the, the, uh, the yolk, uh, your butter, your milk, your cream, uh, your cheeses, um, you guys are kind of consuming a lot of these, uh, LDLs, right? These low density lipoproteins or low density lipids. They're, they're synonymous for one another. Um, you know that when we start to develop plaque, which is caused by um, the presence of LDLs, 
uh, lesions that are formed within the lining of the blood vessel, uh, the recruitment of leukocytes and macrophages and other immune factors. Um, we start to get the, uh, the combination of all these things working together and they start to develop this type of plaque, right? And this type of plaque. And what starts to happen is we start to have a buildup of red blood cells, right? Which we call thrombosis or, or clotting of red blood cells. And then we have very little red blood cells getting through this narrow patch here, which means that's trouble for the rest of the, the heart, right? Uh, that needs oxygen and needs red blood cells and needs macronutrients to be delivered. Um, so this plaque here is composed of lipids and fibrous tissues and, um, I'm going to show you something on the next slide, which will help kind of make sense of that. It can be unstable or stable. So, so a lot of times this thing can break off and it can, it could completely restrict blood in other areas if it breaks off, right? So we can have a stable or unstable plaque and this can rupture and it can swell. If you guys, if we go back to this picture here, you can see the difference between a healthy coronary artery and one that is experiencing thrombosis. So you see this swelling here, it's much, much bigger than this guy here, okay? So we will get some swelling with that as well. Um, and this can lead to basically the sudden and complete uh, occlusion of uh, other vessels in the heart. So if this breaks off, this leads into some pretty serious problems and this can cause myocardial infarction and or heart attack all right so i'm going to give you guys the next slide here slide 10. um this is an entire process of the cellular events that occur when we start to develop uh atherosclerotic plaque and i'm going to draw this for you guys i'm going to upload another video that that basically talks about all these players and how they work together i just want you to see that we have the major players here we have the ldl right monocytes and t-cells i will talk to you about when i upload the new video where i'm drawing all this out and talking to you when we have um we have disruption to the endothelial cell layer uh, we have the ldl that can kind of get through it can can become oxidized it will activate macrophages, macrophages and foam cells, right? So um, this will be converted into a foam cell and then we'll start to kind of develop all this, um, this plaque here, right? Because the foam cell will undergo apoptosis um, and it will kind of merge itself into this plaque that we're developing here. And as inflammation is destroying and damaging this endothelial cell layer up here, we have another layer of endothelial cells that are going to basically try to fix itself and encapsulate this plaque, right? So that's why this is so dangerous and you can see that there's a protrusion here of this lining that starts to get into uh, the lumen here where we have the red blood cells and all that so i am going to draw you a very in-depth video on this we'll go through this piece by piece so you fully fully understand it um, right now i'm just trying to introduce the concept to you so everything right now is the introduction of the concept just getting you used to the major players and that's it Okay, so we will uh, we will talk about this a bit more. Uh, maybe by Friday, I'll have that lecture up for you guys. All right, so we're kind of done uh, talking about the overview of the pathology. So I, I threw a lot at you guys. I use some very basic terms, and then when I upload the video for you guys on Friday. Um, we are going to kind of explore this in more detail and I will give you the proper terms for this cap. Um, we'll talk about what the monocytes and T cells do. We'll talk about uh, oxidated LDL and how oxidated LDL and macrophages um, basically are work together and do form, foam cell formation. And then we'll talk about how the plaque is made and what the cap does. So we'll get into way more details about that. I just wanted to kind of uh, wet your palate a bit. All right, so this you can read on your own, just giving you some facts about the epidemiology of it. I don't need to um, really kind of talk about this. You can read this. Uh, but I do want to spend some time on symptoms because if you are uh, working with somebody and they are recovering or they are on their way to an MI, which is myocardial infarction, 
you need to know what some of these symptoms are just in case they start to experience them while they're exercising. So uh, true or false, somebody that is living with or experiencing, maybe even unbeknownst to them, heart issues, um, exercise can be a really dangerous thing for them. And the, the answer should be true immediately. Yes, exercise could be uh, catastrophic to somebody if they are living with a mild myocardial infarction or something that is developing, uh, or they have recently uh, are just recovering from one. So we have to know what the symptoms are associated with this so we know what to look for, right? And these major players I, I've put here for you, um, pain is the most common symptom uh, with patients that are experienced uh, uh, MI. And this I'm going to kind of drop down to here really quick. Uh, the pain can be in your arms, your shoulder, your neck, your teeth, your jaw, your abdomen, or your back. And the back seems to be the big one that most people ignore. They, they kind of think they're having a uh, spasm or a muscle cramp, or they just slept on their back wrong. Uh, but these are the major locations of where the pain is. Okay. You can have uh, pretty severe fatigue, uh, heart palpitations. So you can have um, kind of uh, increases in heart rate and, and maybe you're not even doing anything. You're just sitting still, but you have fluctuations in heart rate. It's not consistent. Dyspenia, which means you basically have labored breathing, um, let's do cough, fainting, lightheadedness or dizziness, nausea or vomiting, um, profuse sweating. Um, and, and these are kind of the, these are kind of the major signs or the telltale signs. And I, I and I do ask that you just kind of memorize these or you just kind of get acquainted with them so that you say, okay, well, when somebody's having an uh, MI, this is what to look for. And it's going to get a bit confusing because some of the other things that we're going to talk about in this course, it, it seems like this list of uh, characters here is in every single uh, symptom to look for. Um, but, you know, just kind of just, just kind of get uh, familiar with this. OK, um, and let's talk. A, oops, hit the wrong button. Give me one. Sorry about that. Um, so like many pathologies or diseases, um, Doing a simple blood chemistry panel can tell us a lot about what is happening in the body. Um, and the blood can tell us if there's the presence of damaged tissue uh, in the myocardium. So uh, we can do a blood test to determine if there is damage, if there was damage, or if we are developing some type of damage um, due to, we'll basically concentrate on the concentrations of, of certain uh, proteins or certain things in the blood. So one of the things that we'll see when there is a uh, MI developing is we'll have an increase in white blood cells. Well, that's kind of not the best way of determining because just by getting a cough or developing um, maybe the flu or, you know, some sort of uh, acute illness, you're going to have a spike in white blood cells. If you exercised and you come in and you do a blood test, you're going to see fluctuations in blood cells, right? It might be up, it might be low. Um, but we can, we can kind of single out certain biomarkers that represent the cardiac muscles, right? Or the cardiomyocytes or the myocardium, right? So we can really focus on some of these markers. And what these markers are, are troponin, right? Creatine kinase and lactate dehydrogenase. You guys should know what those are, right? So troponin is the regulatory protein that um, is essential for muscle contraction, right? In skeletal muscle and in cardiac muscle, cardiomyocytes. I told you that troponin is there, right? So we know that we have um, the thin filament, right? So here we have actin, and then we have troponin, right? Um, and we have tropomyosin, and we know that calcium binds to troponin, which releases tropomyosin, which allows actin to be freed up, and we can have cross-bridge formation with myosin, and that is how we have contraction that occurs, right? So troponin is one of the things that we can measure in the blood. If there is troponin floating in the blood, that is an indication of potential cardiomyocyte or, or car myocardial damage, right? So damage to uh, the actual um, muscle. Uh, the other one is, uh, let's see, where's the other one? Why is this button not working? Get to the next slide. Come on. Oh, let me do this. Give me a second. There we go. Um, 
The other one is, is creatine kinase. And of course, you guys know what that one is, right? We've talked about that so many times in exercise physiology. Uh, we know that's the most important enzyme for ATP generation and ATP recycling, right? So we see uh, creatine kinase. When we have a muscle contraction, we have ADP. Creatine kinase comes down. It donates a phosphate to ADP. And we have ATP again, right? So it is basically responsible for the generation and recycling of ATP. ATP. So creatine kinase also enters the bloodstream um, when there is a myocardial infarction developing. And then the last one we have is lactate dehydrogenase. And of course, you guys know uh, what that one is. That lactate dehydrogenase is responsible for taking pyruvate and turning it into lactate in anaerobic glycolysis. So the three major proteins that we can look at in the blood and used to determine if there's any sort of um, issues with the heart and damage to the heart muscle are these three guys right here. So uh, we can absolutely do that. Let me move on here. Okay, now we're going to talk a little bit about tests and evaluations. And we're going to talk about ECG or EKG, um, whatever, whatever you want to, whatever you want to call it. Um, electrocardiogram, right? It's, it's called ECG or EKG. Now, we're going to talk about ECG in 456A. If, if you are in that class, if you already had 456A, you know what this is. So what I'm going to do is I just want you to basically know the basics. I want you to know what the P, Q, R, S, and T wave represent. This is why I had given you guys that lecture earlier on uh, that talked about the mechanical and the electrical properties of a uh, cardiac cycle, right? So um, this is where that's going to come into play, right? Um, I have some well-made videos for you guys that I found on YouTube. I, I put them in the modules. It says dig deeper. So make sure you guys watch those. Um, they animate and draw and explain the ECG much better than I can with the time that uh, we have, right? So this one is going to be put in your hands so that you can understand the basics, okay? Basically, what does this wave represent? What does this wave represent? What does this wave represent? That's it. That's all I'm looking for you to understand. So if I were to say, what does the R wave represent? You know what that is, okay? Um, and when we get into 456A, we'll talk about it in more depth uh, as we get uh, more into our exercise uh, evaluation pro uh, methodologies, okay? So um, this is a test that records the timing and the strength of the electrical signals that make up the heartbeat, right? And that's why I gave you guys that video so you guys understood that. So when we're looking uh, looking at an ECG or an EKG, a doctor or a clinician or an exercise scientist can basically gain insight about the heart rhythm and look for any irregularities. And those irregularities will come in these waves. And this one seems to be the most popular wave with irregularities, okay? Um, I have some great videos on this for you guys. Um, I just want you to know the basics. You are on your own with that, okay? Um, if I look at the next one here, we're going to look at a few more basically definitions of what this is. I put this wave here. This is a normal um, ECG wave, right? You can see, uh, again, I, let me just kind of go back for a second. We're looking at these waves, P, Q, R, S, and T, all right? P, Q, R, S, and T. So we can see here we have the P, Q, R, S, and T. It's all here. And then when we start to develop issues with the heart, you can see that, again, just the basics, there's just variations in what a normal wave looks like versus different types of compromised waves. So this is what we look for when there's changes in this wave. And you guys can say, okay, well, uh, this one has a higher R wave. This one, there's a weird sort of accelerate a rising from the uh, S to T wave. This one here doesn't look like this at all. This one's here more circular. So you can see that there's all these kind of different ways of, of um, changing the wave based upon what the heart is doing. Okay. And this T wave 
basically represents the ventricles when they're relaxing, right? So this one here is kind of supporting ventricular activity. Um, you guys can kind of read this. I, you really don't need to because I gave you those videos and those videos will uh, explain everything to you guys. They're so well made. One of them is by a nursing student she, or a nurse and she just did a wonderful job. So those are in the modules. Please watch those. Um, other sort of tests and evaluations we can do other than laboratory and other than ECG is we can do um, multiple gated analysis, which basically uh, tags the red blood cells. Okay, so we can put a tag, we can put a label, a chemical label on the red blood cells, and this is also known as MUGA, okay, multiple gated analysis. And we can image, we can basically watch the red blood cells. We can watch where they go in motion and we can see when they enter the heart and we can see, uh, we can kind of look at the injection fraction that can be assessed because we have a tag on the red blood cells. So you can tag them, you can identify where they are in the blood, you can identify how much of them are being ejected from the ventricles out into uh, systemic circulation. So that is another method. Um, we can also do an MRI image, right? And the MRI image can also be used to assess uh, the ventricle wall, uh, complications in the ventricle wall. So this image here that I have for you guys, uh, this is of a 56-year-old man, uh, 10 days post myocardial infarction, right? So you can see this is 10 days post myocardial infarction. Um, the clinicians will inject a contrast into the bloodstream. So any of you guys that have ever had an MRI, you know what that is, right? They, they put this dye into your blood. And then uh, if you've had that done, you know that you can feel the dye. Uh, your, all your blood gets warm uh, and you taste metal in your mouth. It's not a great experience. Um, and then you can see with that dye, you can see if there's any enhancement to the myochondria or you can see if there's any sort of uh, destructive tissue that is there. Um, and you can see here with the arrows, you can see that 10 days post myocardial infarction, there is some damage here. Um, and again, this isn't an MRI class. I'm just kind of showing you that we can tell uh, through this MRI imaging that there is damage to the, the cardiomyocytes and there's also damage to the descending artery. So this, we can see that through an MRI. All right. So those are just kind of some quick. So if I said, Hey guys, what are some ways that we can test and evaluate? You can say, okay, well, there's, there's, um, symptoms, right? We know that there's symptoms there. We know that there's blood tests we can do. And okay, well, if I said, what, what are the blood tests? What, what are we going to look for in the blood test? You would say, oh, then we're going to look for, um, troponin. We're going to look for, um, creatine kinase. We're going to look for, um, lactate dehydrogenase. And I'll say, okay, well, what do those things do in the heart? Well, I, I know exactly what they do because I've heard this a thousand times. Um, you can also say, well, we can do MRI in, in imaging or we can do multiple gated analysis and I'll say, okay, well, what, what does that do? And you say, okay, well, multiple gated analysis, you introduce a chemical tag, which basically you tag to the red blood cells and then you can follow and you can image the red blood cells throughout the body. You could see if there's thrombosis, you can see if there's any clotting um, with this, this type of tag or you can run um, MRI and okay, yeah, you got it. That's good. All right, so now we are gonna get into the uh, exercise component. Oh, and I forgot also the other test you can do is an ECG or an EKG. And you guys are going to follow uh, the videos I left for you. And you're going to take really, really good notes about what these waves mean. And uh, you're going to use my introductory uh, lesson that I had given you guys on the electrical and mechanical components of a cardiac cycle. And this should all make perfect sense to you guys. Okay. So now we're going to get to the good stuff, the exercise. Okay. Um, this next section is going to discuss uh, a couple different things and, and you'll see this repeated from here on in this kind of same format. What is the pathology? What is the overview? What are some of the cellular things that are happening? Uh, what are the symptoms? And then we'll start talking about how exercise can be implemented in this process. Okay. So we're going to talk about, um, what are the effects on exercise response, the effects of exercise training, why we train people with certain complications, uh, medications. I'm not going to test you guys really on much uh, with medications just because 
we don't have the time to, to really go in deep on some of this. And, and if you guys aren't familiar with medications, kind of no matter where you are in your journey, especially if you're, you know, in medicine or clinician or, uh, you know, whatever path you're going on, you'll always have a reference manual to kind of tell you what the medications are and what they do. Um, we're going to be talking about what are the recommendations for exercise and then start talking about how we test people for exercise and then how we design a program for them. So that's what this is going to look like each and every lecture we do. Okay. So let's kind of get started on this here. Um, so the effects on exercise response. So of course, a heart attack or a myocardial infarction is going to challenge the hemodynamics of, 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 of somebody's hemodynamics and their ability to basically produce maximal and sub maximal exercise, right? So if the heart is compromised, that means that the blood flow is compromised. That means that the muscles or the tissue that extracts everything in the blood is going to be compromised. And it's basically the entire circuit is going to be compromised. Okay. So you might be asking yourself, well, what is hemodynamics? I haven't heard that before. Okay. Well, well, hemodynamics is basically the dynamics of blood flow. And as I showed you in that previous picture, um, you know, all those previous pictures, myocardial infarction impacts the coronary artery, right? Blood flow. We get thrombosis. We get clotting. We get a plaque development. And then we get myocardial ischemia because we don't have oxygen being delivered to the lower portions of the heart. And then we get um, degradation of cardiomyocytes and we get tissue damage of the myocardium, right? So th there's a couple of different hits here. And if it starts with the the blood delivery, right? If, if the dynamics of blood flow are changed, well, that means everything downstream is going to be changed as well. So, uh, you know, the circulatory system, it's controlled by hemostatic mechanisms for or of auto regulation. Okay. And the heart um, plays a very important role in that regulation process. Um, hemodynamics ultimately begins at the heart, which supplies the driving force of all blood flow throughout the body. Right. So, um, and then cardiac output uh, of the heart it propels the blood through the arteries and the veins, um, and it basically acts as a function of ventricular uh, contraction, right? So these changes in the heart are going to change the hemodynamics, which is going to change how tissue receives and basically utilizes all that important stuff within the blood. Um, so when we have a, a myocardial infarction, it reduces aerobic capacity from 50 to 70% from your age predicted max. Um, so everybody's, we all have a age predicted max for a VO2. Uh, generally those of you that are 20 to 30 years of age, your age predicted max for your VO2 score is about a 40. All right. So if we, um, if, if your VO2 was reduced by 50 to 70%, that means your 40 would be dropped to 20 or, or, or 17%. Um, so there's a substantial decrease in your body's ability to take in oxygen, deliver oxygen, utilize oxygen, and, and exercise. So it's going to have a severe disruption on that. You're going to have a decrease in oxygen transport. You're going to have a decrease in basically cardiac output. And you guys should know by now that cardiac output is stroke volume and heart rate, right? So those are the two major components of cardiac output. So, um, yeah, so the effects on exercise are going to be drastic, right? So this cardio myo, uh, the myocardial infarction is going to have a, a drastic effect on somebody's ability uh, to exercise. This is important. Make sure you guys take note of this, okay? There is a reduction of 50 to 70% of aerobic capacity, which means when you do a VO2 max test or a maximum oxygen uptake, uh, uptake test, uh, you're going to be 50% less than those who are the same age as you. Okay. And that's how, that's how damaging this, uh, this condition is. Let's move on to the next slide. So we're going to talk a little more about the effects on exercise response. So now the other thing that we have to keep in mind is ischemia and narrowing. 
okay? And this can happen, the ischemia and the narrowing um, can happen in the ventricle. So the two major alterations that accompany the myocardial infarction is ischemia and narrowing. So a myocardial infarction um, will result in the progressive and uh, aggressive decline in ejection fraction and stroke volume. So what does this mean? Uh, this means that the heart is going to pump out way less blood during a stroke volume and during an ejection fraction. So there's going to be less blood that is going to leave uh, the left ventricle and enter the bloodstream. Um, this is generally accompanied by ischemia, and basically ischemia occurs when blood flow to the heart is obstructed by the blockage of the coronary artery, as I, as I mentioned before, okay? So if we look here, if we have this progressive decline in ejection fraction and stroke volume, um, let's look at a normal heart. This would be the left ventricle, right? So the left ventricle here, we have a very specific size, right? If we cut the heart from a bird's eye view and we just kind of looked at this chamber where the blood sits uh, before it's ejected out into, let's say, the aorta and the systemic uh, circulation. So you see how we're just kind of taking this glass and cutting through the heart, and now we're doing a bird's eye view of that cut. They call this a cross-sectional analysis. When we have an infarcted heart and we have the damage to the tissue, right? Uh, we have the cardiomyocytes that are undergoing apoptosis here. Well, what happens is we get left ventricle thinning. So look at what happened. Let's compare this to this, right? So now that wall starts to get way thinner, okay? So that's the narrowing of the left ventricle, okay? And obviously, this is going to impact not only blood volume that's being ejected, but it's also going to impact heart rate, right? So generally what happens is the, you're going to have a much faster heart rate because the heart has to work twice as hard to basically get less blood into the bloodstream or into the circulation, okay? Um, and it's going to basically also impair your pacemaker cells. So you're going to have impairment of the SA and the AV node, and you would be able to see that on an ECG. So when you go back to your video, kind of take a look at that, all right? Um, and then, uh, as I mentioned, when we have that plaque buildup, and we have that initiation of the atherosclerosis product, uh, that plaque can rupture. And if that plaque ruptures, um, we can also have ventricular arrhythmia. So we, there's all these kind of problems that, that kind of happen here. But the big takeaway message here is that um, not only do we have this decrease in O2 transport, we have a decrease in cardiac output, we have a decrease in O2 uptake and use. And one of the reasons that's happening is because we have ischemia and we have narrowing happening at the same time. Um, so again, keep all these pieces together in mind. Okay, so here's he, here's how you should be studying. Okay, he said that there's a problem with hemodynamics. What are hemodynamics? Well, that's how the blood flows through the vessels, and that's how blood interacts with the heart. That's how blood interacts with the young. Uh, I'm sorry, the lungs. There's all these complications with blood flow. Not only, <laughs> excuse me. Not only are there complications with blood flow, but we also have impaired oxygen uptake and utilization, and that's cut in half by 50%. So we have blood issues, we have oxygenation issues, we have oxygen utilization issues, we have a decrease in oxygen transport. So not only are we using less of it, there's a decrease in transport, and that makes sense because the hemodynamics have changed right? And as a result of all that, we have a change in cardiac output. So the stroke volume and the heart rate has changed, right? So these are this is how you should be studying pathology. And we know that this is going to impact heart rate as well. And you say, okay, well, why is all this happening? Well, because we have blockage of the coronary artery. We have low oxygen being delivered to the rest of the heart. We have infarcted tissue or an infarcted heart where this is not getting uh, any oxygen. So we have ischemia here. And then we start to have degradation and this thins out. Well, what is this going to do? This is going to change pressure in the ventricle. It's going to change how much volume of blood can go into the left ventricle. If we have this narrowing, we're going to have less contracting fibers, which is going to change how much blood is pushed out into the aorta. Uh, so there's all sorts of issues that happen here. And this is what I was mentioning about in that first lecture is about this domino effect. If one thing goes down, 
everything else starts to go down. So keep all those in mind. That's definitely going to be on a quiz or on an exam. So now let's talk about the effects of exercise training. Um, if we start to exercise somebody that has a MI, this is what we can kind of look to see. Um, research demonstrates that both acute and moderate training have benefits in populations that have suffered from an MI. So now we're talking about individuals that have already experienced one. And those that exercise following a heart attack have been shown to increase their VO2 by at least 20%. So if we go back to this one, we saw that with an MI, we're going to have a decrease of 50 to 70 percent of a VO2 max or the ability to take in oxygen and utilize it. But we can restore some of this if we start exercising after we have somebody that has experienced an MI. So we can see that we can gain 20 percent of that back. OK, um, and these scores can be as low as 23.5 milliliters per kilogram per minute. And if those of you that have uh, already had to, to uh, 456A, you know what this means, right? This is us kind of talking in um, VO2 max scores. And if you haven't had that yet and you're not sure what a VO2 max is, uh, we will be getting to that momentarily in 456A, um, okay? Um, we have improved ventilation, right? So they can, they can breathe better. We begin to see relief of those symptoms that we talked about, right? So the chest pain and the discomfort and all those other things. Um, when we exercise after a, uh, MI, we get more control of heart rate and more control in heart rate variability. So that means that the heart is responding better to stimulus, whether it's walking up a flight of stairs and then the heart rate after you go up the flight of stairs, it drops, right? Because that stimulus is gone. Um, reduction in body weight, which is wonderful. Reduction in LDL in VLDL, right? So when we exercise, we kind of utilize a little more of those uh, bad guys that we talked about right over. Let me get back to it real quick right here. Hit that, right? So we have a reduction in the bad guys and we see an increase in the good guys. So when we exercise uh, following a MI, we can kind of restore this balance here that I was showing you guys, right? So it goes from this back to this. And if we have this balance here, what happens? Well, then we can start restoring the vessels to a healthy state as well. So exercise, uh, as ACSM has told us, is truly, truly medicine, right? Um, so we get re reduction in body weight, which is wonderful. Uh, the heavier we are, the harder the heart has to work. Reduction in LDL and VDL, VLDL, very low density lipids. An increase in the HDL, right, which was anti atherosclerosis and anti-inflammation. And we talked about this one being pro-inflammation and pro-atherosclerosis. Um, and then uh, we have protection from further triggering another heart attack. So this is why we would want to put somebody through an exercise program, because if they just take medication, guys, what is that medication going to do? It's not going to do anything because they're going to be basically continuing the lifestyle and the habits that put them there in the first place. All right. So on the next slide, uh, we're going to talk about uh, some medications. Okay. Um, I'm going to let you guys look this up. I'm not going to talk about this much because I'm not going to get into, we could, I could literally do a whole physiology on beta blockers and um, uh, other medications that we use. Uh, with people who have suffered from a heart attack. Um, so I'm not going to talk about that much. I just want you to know what they are. You can look at those on your own. Um, we have ACE inhibitors. Um, basically what this is going to do is it's going to stop your body from producing uh, some of these proteins that want to cause vessel constriction, right? So if we have vessel constriction, and we have this narrowing of the lumen, and then we start to build plaque here. Let me get my awesome, I wanna draw. Can I draw? Is it gonna let me do it? It's not gonna let me do it. Um, if we start to get some plaque here, well, if we have a constricted vessel and we get some plaque, well, that means that you're gonna have even more red blood cell buildup and you're gonna have a more aggressive version of that atherosclerosis developing. So when we take an 
ACE inhibitor, um, this, oops, sorry about that. This is going to cause relaxation of the blood vessels. It's going to basically allow it to dilate and stay open so that we have a decrease in blood pressure, even if we have that plaque, right? So all that's going to really do is just open up the lumen, relax the blood vessels, and allow more blood to flow through if we have this kind of plaque development there. Uh, this is kind of showing us how an ACE uh, inhibitor works. Um, and I'm not going to go into this too much. I was initially going to do it, but I figured you guys, I've already given you a tremendous amount of things to do uh, in this lecture and in the previous lecture. So I'm going to let you guys slide on that one. And then we have beta blockers. Um, you guys have probably heard of beta blockers before. Um, these are essentially going to reduce your blood pressure. And it does so through these um, various different receptors, uh, adrenergic receptors where the beta blockers will bind. Um, it's going to decrease heart rate. Um, it's going to basically reduce apoptosis, right, which is going to be the, the destruction of those cardiomyocytes. It's going to reduce inflammation, and it's going to um, essentially help keep blood pressure down. Because just like this one here, if we have constriction of the vessels, we're going to have an increase in blood pressure. And if we have restriction of the vessels with a plaque, well, then that blood pressure is going to be heightened even more. So if we open up the blood vessels... Uh, and we reduce the blood pressure, then that means the heart is not going to have to work as hard. It's not going to be so traumatic uh, on the heart. So that's all I really want to talk about with medications. I really don't want to get too much into that just because you guys already have so much to read. Um, so now let's get into recommendations for exercise and how to test and how to prescribe. So let's dig in. Um, so after a heart attack has happened... It is important to begin regular activity programs, um, maybe activities of daily living or just very low level exercise. And this is going to basically reduce the chance of having another heart attack, an additional heart attack, right? Because just because you had one heart attack doesn't mean you're out of the woods, right? So we got to be cautious of potentially um, having another one if you've already experienced um, your first myocardial infarction. So what, what happens is I'm trying to, sorry, reduce this, um, is when we immediately start to exercise again, we, we begin the process of protecting the body from having another one. Um, most patients are advised to begin cardiac rehabilitation and exercise, um, to, to basically have a faster and safer recovery. Um, and cardiac rehabilitation generally includes exercise prescription. Um, individuals who are undergoing rehabilitation and begin to exercise should start slow. That's obvious and gradually increase. Um, so if you, if you basically had a single exercise session, you might want to start slow and then every three minutes kind of increase the intensity a little bit, increase the activity uh, until it feels moderate, right? Um, and you always got to start slow and we increase the intensity over the three minutes so that way we can observe, we can watch and see um, how somebody is responding to the exercise that we're giving them. So um, we want to have exercise that is lower than five Mets, right? And, and five Mets is, that's pretty active, right? Um, we want to make sure that we're promoting client confidence because after following a heart attack, um, these individuals are going to be reflecting on their lives, reflecting on their choices, uh, thinking about ways that they can change their life, change their lifestyle, change their eating habits, um, change habitual things, spend more time with family, uh, basically feel like they're getting a second chance on life. So we want to really help promote that confidence um, and instill that in them and just say, hey, you know, love this direction you're going. And if you exercise and you stick with me and, and you, you do what you're told and we and we're, we, you change your lifestyle, there will be plenty of plenty of time to, you know, engage in these things that you want to engage in. Uh, we want to provide constant reinsurance to, to these individuals. And um, basically protocols that we, that we work with, with these individuals um, should focus primarily on low extremity exercises, right? So the legs. Um, and if you guys, I, I know for those of you that are in 456A, I put this website up for you guys, but if you guys are, are not in 456A, there's a link here 
And if you press this link, it'll take you to uh, this page here that will show you what kind of activities are at five Mets. Um, let's see if I can hit this link. Let me see if it will let me do it. And if not, that's okay. Oh, it did. So let me bring this up for you guys. Let me close out here just so you can see what we are doing. Where did that go now? Okay, there it is. Uh, okay. So give me one second. Sorry, guys. I'm just kind of trying to rearrange this desktop a bit. So here's what that website is. And if you don't know what five Mets looks like, uh, you can go to this activity categories right here and you can click that. And there's all these different types of things, uh, different types of exercising that you can do that kind of tells us where the Mets are. So uh, if you have somebody that just had a heart attack, maybe home activities is the best thing to do. So if we click home activities and we look at this 2011 section here, you can see Mets right here. So general cleaning, sweeping, carpet or floors, 3.3 um, Mets. All right. Uh, cleaning, mopping. Uh, standing 3.5 Mets, cleaning windows 3.2 Mets, um, multiple house, housekeeping tasks all at once with vigorous exercise or not exercise effort is 4.3. So that kind of gives you an idea of where that intensity is at. Um, and we can kind of get out of here because you guys can look at that on your own. Uh, so we want lower extremity intensity or exercise with a low intensity that works up to a moderate intensity and we want to stay beneath five Mets. All right. So this is very different than working with athletes and working with healthy populations. Let me go back to the next slide here. Testing. Okay. This is going to be important. So the exercise testing earlier than six weeks post MI is accepted as standard medical practice. So, so what does that mean? Uh, we can perform a test six weeks post MI. All right. Um, and what these tests generally consist of is treadmill tests or cycle ergometer tests. All right. And I have this picture here where you can see an individual that's just suffered an MI. They are on a treadmill test. You guys can see the ECGs or the EKG that is monitoring everything. We have a blood pressure cuff. cuff. Generally, there is something on the finger which measures uh, oxygen saturation. And all these probes here are basically measuring different things with the heart. So um, we can do uh, sometimes a stress test. Uh, or sometimes just a walking test where we are measuring uh, basically how the heart is functioning under stress. And that stress is going to be under five Mets. Okay. So if they're on a treadmill and we want to do an ECG and we want to do a blood pressure test and we start three minutes, well, what can we do with intensity? Because remember I said every three minutes we want to increase intensity. Um, so we can either increase speed or we can increase grade, right? And I would not recommend increasing speed. I would always go with the grade and keep the speed the same. So this individual could do three minutes at a 0% grade. And then after three minutes, if we see that the heart is not stressing too much, we can increase the grade and we can get the information we want there to see how the heart is responding to exercise. Um, so what the research has shown us is that if we look here, the physiological exercise response, so how these individuals respond to graded workloads um, for individuals that have MI, that have survived it, is as followed. When they do this graded exercise test, right, we increase the grade of the treadmill every three minutes. Generally, they'll get a maximum heart rate of about 118 to 136 beats per minute. So that's kind of like the safe range for them to be in. Um, they're gonna have a peak systolic blood pressure between 137 and 170. So that's that top muscle, right? That's that top number, systolic pressure. And they're gonna have a maximum workload between 4.8 and 7.0 METs. So this is generally where these individuals tend to land. Uh, and what their tolerance is, and we, we don't want to really exceed these values, okay? So somebody that has recovered, 
If we get them in earlier than six weeks post MI, it is accepted as standard medical practice. So we can get them in uh, as early as five weeks and get them uh, exercising. Um, and the tests that we can run to monitor changes in the heart or to see if uh, these individuals are capable of exercising our treadmill or cycle ergometer tests where we are using lower extremities and the ranges in which these individuals will operate in safely are here. So make sure you guys remember that this is, this is kind of the safe range. This is the safe range. And this is a little bit high. Remember what they said that they want to keep it under five Mets, but this is just showing the mean values of people that, um, have done exercise, uh, recovering after a MI. So let's move to the next slide. Uh, low level exercise. What, what does that look like? Um, so uh, exercise should be conducted at an intensity level considerably low, uh, lower than the anticipated peak capacity. And that usually anticipated peak capacity is basically determined by our age and our health and our fitness level, right? Uh, as I said, we want to increase progressively or gradually in two to three minute stages. Okay. So that could look like alterations in walking pace. Uh, they should be able to talk with you and not be a be buzz. That was a typo, uh, be winded. So that's a really easy way to say if, to determine if they're, um, if it's the Mets are too high. All right. Um, hemodynamics should be measured if possible at each increment. So we're, we should be looking at heart rate, blood pressure, O2 saturation, et cetera, right? So these, this is what low level exercise looks like. This is some recommendations of some things that we can do while they're doing low level exercise. Obviously this gentleman here, uh, is not doing any, uh, exercise that is too, uh, taxing because you can see that he's pedaling the trainers pedaling, and it looks like they're conversing and laughing. So that would suggest that this individual can talk, right? He's not uh, too winded or there's no bumblebees that are floating about either. Um, hemodynamics, uh, obviously she is not monitoring that, but we can monitor blood pressure and heart rate with a watch or a heart rate monitor. Uh, O2 saturation, a lot of watches now have an application where you can look at O2 saturation as well. So we could easily uh, gain this information. We want an O2 saturation of about 99 or 98%. Uh, once we get below 92 or 91, that's dangerous. We'd want to stop um, exercising if your saturation is too low. Um, we should be able to measure exercise capacity by VO2 assessment. So we should do a VO2 max test. Obviously we cannot do a maximal test on an individual like this. So we would have to do a sub max test and we'll be talking about what these sub max tests are, right? We don't want them to, we don't want to put their body through a maximum test where we'll stress them. We want to do a sub max test just to identify what their VO2 score is. And we believe that they'll probably start around 20 milliliters per kilogram uh, per minute, or maybe 22 or 23. And as I showed you guys before, uh, when we begin an exercise program, they can increase that by 20%. So we can increase their VO2 through exercising. But if we, if we want to know if we're increasing it, we got to have a baseline measurement. Uh, so we got to be able to get that information And here in our laboratory, uh, which you guys don't have access to this semester because of COVID, uh, we have the machines here to do this. And, uh, we would be doing that under normal circumstances. Um, the test duration should be about eight to 10 minutes, and we should be getting doctor permission if we're lifting weights. So what this is saying, if we summarize all this, it's saying that when we assess and when we're trying to get information, we are going to do two to three minute stages. Uh, we could start with just walking or we could start on a cycle. We can increase the intensity or we, you know, uh, we, here we can increase the intensity on the actual bike, or we can increase the pace of walking 
We want to have a safety net and just make sure that these individuals can talk with you. They can speak with you. They're not too winded. If they cannot communicate with you speaking, well, that means that we have to decrease the intensity because uh, whatever you're doing is taxing on them. Uh, we should have some way of measuring the hemodynamics. So we should be watching blood pressure, heart rate, O2 saturation. Um, at some point, we should get an official assessment with VO2. And then when we do this type of uh, testing to get this information, uh, it should it should not exceed 8 to 12 minutes, okay? Because that's all these people have. There's not much more they have in them, uh, especially having recently recovered from a heart attack. Uh, let's get into the last few slides here.